for this issue of the zine we're doing, which is on subtext. I think our zine, and kind of what I've been trying to figure out lately is that balance between the kind of like heady sort of thinking about topics, but then the also like expressions of that. And we did that kind of the last scene in terms of like respite. It was, we took a very like um, analytic tack to some degree, like exploring a certain topic in terms of how we think about it, but also just like how people feel about that topic, which is kind of important to us. Mm -hmm. So this one is very interesting because the whole text subtext and the, the, the um, topic, the theme of this scene is subtext also kind of bridges that for me, at least what I kept coming back to was like the conscious subconscious sort of aspect of um, conversation and things like mm -hmm. that. So, and it was interesting that like a lot of what we kind of got in response to, to like text and subtext was like in like relationships, like romantic relationships specifically, but also just like relationships between people, mm -hmm. like really trying to communicate something. And um, in terms of subtext, it's all about communication, right? It's like mm -hmm. communicating without the use of words, which is kind of what it came down to as far as subtext goes. And then we tried to just figure out why we try and do those sort of things. Like what's the purpose of subtext? Mm -hmm. um, and we did that by like, just kind of putting a blanket like, what do you think of subtext? Like, should we always be trying to use it? Should we be trying to get rid of it? Like, should we be just trying to say everything we mean? And people responded with kind of reflections, but also like um, kind of a bit more like poetry and other like purely like linguistic or narrative pieces that kind of um, use subtext as a mode of communication. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yours definitely falls on the side of like kind of a more reflective piece on subtext. And you've got a lot of background as far as like philosophy and psychoanalysis and psychology. So uh, that's why there's a lot to definitely explore with, mm. with your piece. And you wrote um, a much longer essay for, for subtext and that we, we pared down a little bit to put in the zine. But I did want to explore all the things you, you wrote because there was a lot there, I feel like, that kind of tackled the subject as a whole which is really cool, so. Well, thank you so yeah. much, yeah. So um, I, I first heard about this theme uh, right around New Year's Eve, I believe, and uh, you know, I, I kind of, it took me a while to really um, settle on, on what I wanted to write. You know, I actually started writing something and then I ended up th just kind of throwing it away because I, I didn't have a real clear, it, it didn't really come together for me until I, um, kind of sat down and I really thought, you know, what what do I have to really say about subtext? And and in order to do that, I kind of had to position myself in um, w what I saw to be the sort of conventional readings of subtext. So it, it really clicked for me uh, first when I realized, you know, a lot of <clears throat> subtext is really at least um, c conventionally thought to be around flirtation or around a sort of... Um, sexual undertone. I mean, you know, so many jokes, you watch a sitcom and, and so often the jokes are around the subtext or around uh, the phrasing of something. And, you know, this goes back to, to Freud and the idea of the Freudian slip that, that I um, might say something, you know, the classic Freud joke is when you say one thing and you mean your mother. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, uh, but, you know, so I thought, okay, so I need to kind of position myself in what do I have to contribute um, to the idea of subtext beyond this conventional reading. And then I thought, well, the other, the other aspect of subtext besides just the sexual undertone is um, how language is often used to kind of signal in-group, out-group, or how, you know, it can be, this is almost... Um, would you, the, would you yeah. let that directly to like personal versus like other, like in-group the, very, the most basic in group being yourself versus out group being anybody. But I mean, you, or? well, no, I mean, more just a kind of like almost tribal signaling. Like you're in my tribe, like the certain subtext, but it could be even more than that. It's like really like, so besides the kind of first figure of subtext, because I, I decided to call my paper four figures of subtext. So the first one was kind of the Freudian subtext, you know, uh, the subtext of. Um, you know, the person says after the date, oh, do you want to come up for coffee? And they yeah. maybe don't really mean coffee. They <laughs> might mean something else. But, you know, the, uh, like in the movie Brassed Off, the guy says, do you want to come up for coffee? And she says, oh, I don't drink coffee. And he says, oh, I, that's okay. I, I don't have any. <laughs> um, it's, you know, that's the, 
But so, but then as far as the in-group, out-group signaling, I was thinking more about, and even just more generally about power. I chose the second figure, the, the, the name power, because I was thinking like, you know, the subtext could be um, like a government agency that puts out this kind of message, you know, you're welcome to speak up, but the subtext is uh, keep your mouth shut, you know, or yeah. like there's a, there's a great joke, uh, I think it was about... Stalin, where Stalin's giving a talk and uh, and then someone complains and says in protest and says I disagree with you and then someone else says you idiot he'll he'll kill you if you dis if you say that and then Stalin goes no 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 I welcome I welcome all op all opinions and then you know the the guy who gets killed is the one who pointed it out so there's there's the sort uh -huh. of the sort of you know the way power can work is that you know you have to play this game of oh yeah we're all free to speak we're all included but the subtext is only the people who are included are you know the ones who agree or something like and, that and that's where i feel like subtext is a lot about like what you're allowed to say and what things you're not allowed to say and mm -hmm. it's okay if you say them without saying them but like there's only certain things that are allowed in the realm of language like right yeah. right right i mean the the it's also kind of the weird thing in language where if you uh if you you know if someone asks you if you liked their essay and you say it was interesting well that's that's socially acceptable and the subtext there is that you didn't really like it that much but then if they say i didn't like it well the subtext there is not only that they didn't like it that they have a personal vendetta against you or <laughs> yeah. that they're going above and beyond the sort of social niceties so so yeah so just to do a quick overview of these four figures you know i i kind of i started with sex and then i went to power and i thought okay these are kind of you know um, I even I think I even quoted uh, unless I removed it I, I think it's in there there's a quote from from Henry Kissinger that you know everything in life is about uh, about sex except for sex which is about power <laughs> so so these two themes are very much um, sort of the bread and butter of a lot of um, a lot of writing about language and about how language is used and um, you know and that's really I kind of associate the first one with the kind of psychoanalytic reading, uh, or at least Freudian, and then the second one I associated with Foucault, but it's really a lot of different postmodern theorists, critical theorists. I just chose, uh, you know, Michel Foucault because he, he kind of wrote a lot about how language is used um, to marginalize certain peoples, or again, to kind of signal power and to enforce power. And, um, but then I thought, um, and then you know we can we can kind of dig into these different figures. But I really thought, um, what what do I have to contribute beyond this? You know, what else? You know, and and it it came to me. I mean, I'm I'm kind of I'm a big fan of the work of Carl Jung. I've I've been a you know Jungian for for many years, and um, I thought, well, there's also something that Jung always does, which is when he's reading a text, he's looking for the archetypal subtext. He's looking for what myth it resonates with or what narrative, what story. You know, you might be listening to a talk from Elon Musk of Tesla and he's talking about making cars or, or whatever, but or going to space, but the subtext is this sort of, you know, we could we could amplify the subtext with the theme of Prometheus, who's this sort of uh, stealing the, the fire from the gods to bring it to the, to the, to, to the you know, humans, and this Promethean uh, myth of progress, and this narrative of, you know, even very typically masculine narrative, kind of masculine narrative of um, man versus the world, or man versus nature, or how can we use technology to create this utopia? And so the official text, he's just talking about some technological breakthrough, but then the subtext, or, you know, Steve Jobs and, you know, Apple computers, the subtext is always, this is, this is some magical technology that's going to transform the world. And so I really thought that the figure of the archetype, or this, this archetypal level, and then I wanted to have one more, um, because I just felt that, you know, beyond Jung, there there was a really interesting um, sort of uh, split between Jung and some some post-Jungians, which was started by James Hillman. And James Hillman studied with Jung, although he met him when Jung was quite old. But but Hillman um, really had a very different take on, on Jung, and he Hillman didn't care as much for conceptual understandings. He, he very much was into the archetype, but a big part of what, what Hillman wanted to reintroduce into psychology at that time was this figure of Eros. 
And so I, I chose as the fourth figure of subtext Eros and thought, how is Eros different than, than just sex, than just sort of Freud's biological uh, sexual metaphor of just everything being about furthering um, sex drive and, and trying to, you know, Tr tr trying to propagate the species, almost a kind of Darwinian thing that that Freud had had put forth, and that for for Hillman, um, what makes something you know erotic is is much more about its aesthetic. It's much more. It's it's almost like decoupling flirtation from sex. It's not flirting for the sake of this goal of having sex, but it's a flirtatious, mm. playful, uh, and it's also this aestheticizing of things and this sort of um, enjoyment of, of the image for what it is instead of rushing to to conceptualize an image or to interpret it as we might do with Jung's sort of archetypal reading where we say okay yeah Elon Musk is the you know is about Prometheus or whatever well for Hillman it's it's really this kind of it's looking at the erotic elements in terms of what um, stimulates us but but it can it can stimulate our aesthetic sensibilities. We can enjoy it through, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of like sexualized, but it's not really sexualized. It's, but it's more it's, of an experience rather than like. It's it's almost the kind of erotic. It's in in a way it would be like the the like erotic enjoyment of the image itself. It's how you know it's not necessarily you know. People it's not about knowing about what you're experiencing, but just experiencing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that that too. And it's not about the goal of, of reproduction or even the goal of um, discharge of psychic tension, which was something that was a big thing for Freud, yeah. you know, that we, we have this pent-up, repressed sexuality that we're trying to discharge. And for, for Hillman, it's a lot more about... Um, just the enjoyment uh, itself w without this goal, this sort of playful, playful kind of, it's the reintroduction of Eros, it's its what would kind of bring life into it where you, you enjoy, it's, so the, so subtext then would be like flirtation for the sake of flirtation, you know, or or kind of saying things in a curious way that makes people kind of quizzical or, or tickles, tickles something in them to make them you know, so it's like if I'm choosing to say something, I can maybe, if I see an opportunity for that, I might be able to kind of um, say it in a slightly unusual way. Like just an example of what I would think of kind of Hillman's uh, use, because you know all of his writing is very much in in the mode that he espouses. And um, an interesting, an interesting one. I was on a conversation the other day on a Jungian group, and people were saying, well. You know, what, uh, what do you think of conformity versus nonconformity, and and who are we to say that the nonconformists aren't uh, more developed than the conformists because they've separated and so on? And you know, the thing is, conformists and nonconformists; these are both very conceptual, sort of polarizing, oppositional. This is very much in Jung's frame. And for Hillman, I loved Hillman's answer, and I, I posted this in the group, just a quote from him that. Um, you know, he was kind of asked, well, does all of this psychotherapy leave you as a nonconformist? You know, are you then against the masses and are you kind of staking your ground against the sort of normal way of living? And he said, no, I, I think it, lives, it leaves you slightly at odds with the daily round. So it's, you know, mm. it leaves you slightly askew. But even that way of saying it is kind of an erotic way of saying it to me because it le it's like a ticklish, kind of a flirtatious, yeah. kind of a suggestive. It's using subtext in a suggestive way that leaves a lot to the imagination and leaves a lot for interpretation. And I, I'll just say really quick that I get, I get that same vibe from Jacques uh, Derrida, who founded the school of um, deconstruction, where, you know, he'll often kind of answer in these paradoxical ways or these confusing ways but it's very playful and whimsical and and that's what i mean by by the sort of reintroduction of of the erotic is not not the erotic in the sense of pornography or in the sense of you know there's a lot of different ways we can use that word but it means more like a playful flirtatious thing so so just really quick i'll just kind of recap the the four figures i ended up settling on were sort of you know subtext as a way of conveying uh, sexual desire, subtext as a way of conveying power and, and signaling power, subtext as a sort of, an, maybe without even realizing it, a way of um, conveying certain archetypal themes, and then the final one is this sort of subtext as a whimsical, playful, 
enjoyment of, of language itself and the playing with language. And um, so it's kind of a, an impersonal eros that's not directed at any one person, but is a sort of kind of an erotic use of language itself. Or poetic use, maybe? You know? that, that too, okay. absolutely, sure. absolutely, yeah. That's, so that's how I kind of ended up on it. Nice. So yours is the only one in the zine that um, is just an excerpt. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a much longer piece that I really like, which is why I definitely wanted to do a little bit of a talk about it. Um, but even the zine structured, um, the theme subtext, so even the zine structured kind of in this um, kind of more uh, reflective side, reflective, more essays in the first half and the second half are kind of more creative writing pieces. Um, one thing we talked about when we first started talking about the topic of subtext was just that initial difficulty of like, how do you talk about something that isn't spoken about? Like, and how can you even do that? And what form does that take? And do we just do like, do we do kind of more of a creative piece that like uses subtext or are we trying to use subtext or explore subtext or talk about subtext? Um, and one thing we definitely learned from our first zine and like just kind of how we think about our topics in general is like talking about things that we don't normally talk about, you know, kind of like the bits of, you know, interaction and life that we don't always actively reflect on and we want to like make those more like apparent so we and me personally just like I have much more of a reflective writing style so um yours I would say is obviously the most informed out of any of them oh, um, very kind of you. <laughs> um but it's like definitely the most textual piece which mm -hmm. is I think is a really good point um an entry point into kind of talking about subtext because you have to acknowledge when you're talking about subtext that you're not probably going to have a lot of subtext within the conversation, or maybe, or and we could talk about that too. But um, yeah, I guess the question is whether you're really talking about subtext because yeah, exactly. You know, if you're using subtext, you're actually talking about something else, you know, and uh, and it really gets at you know, say I decide I'm going to talk about subtext and I'm going to make it this very direct kind of approach without any subtext. Well, do I really get to control that, or you know? say I have some resentments or some animosity deep down about this or that, is that going to come through, you know? Yeah. It, my choice of examples, will there be subtext in my choice of examples? Maybe I'm making a veiled jab. I mean, I, <laughs> I had that actual idea when I was looking at, you know, particular examples that I chose. Why did I choose those examples? I can play innocent and I can say, oh, I chose those examples because they seem to to be useful, but... Maybe there's other reasons. Maybe mm -hmm. there's little personal vendettas or personal reasons that I, you know. I mean, you could even look at that yeah. in terms of like what your viewpoints are, even in, you know, like you have a certain opinion of subtext because of your certain experience you've had and then it gives you a certain sort of like idea of it. Um, mm -hmm. And like, yeah, maybe it comes through that way as well. A yeah, maybe my own psychology, you know, maybe I had a really traumatic experience when I was younger of totally missing all the subtext and being publicly humiliated because it was over my head. And so I have this kind of, a, you know, aggressive attitude towards it. Like, yeah. just, just, you know, say what you mean or yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. There's a lot of complexity there. I mean, um, I can speak personally. So my essay, um, which the original title was no subtext. Maybe that even says something. <laughs> um, you know, that the uh, the essay that I wrote, I mean, I really um, didn't get a good handle on it until I, you know, maybe even halfway through, you know, I kind of started just, um, started with language because it was easier for me to, to begin with just, you know, talking about, I started talking about the pleasures of language and how we can enjoy language and what makes language enjoyable. And I kind of start there and then I and then I ended up with this um, typology of subtext, which is what, what what the excerpt ended up being of these four figures of subtext, and um, I felt really happy about that because until then I didn't really have a focus. It was more just kind of this exploration or this general reflection. Hmm. Um, and then and then once I kind of happened across these four figures, it gave me something more tangible to kind of say these are four different meanings of subtext, interpretations of subtext, four different, I mean, I, I say figures, but I mean almost like archetypes, like four different archetypes of subtext, or four different uh, ways of understanding it, or, or ways of, of looking at it. And, and so that was just kind of a natural progression. I mean, I, in the original essay, I have it printed here, it's um, six pages, and I didn't actually get to that until um, page five. So 
and then that's really what the excerpt in the scene is. It's just the last, the yeah, last yeah. Bit, it's like the very end of the essay. It is, right? it's, yeah, and it's a very good, good bit for sure. And I think yeah, it, it's it's. I and I hadn't heard how you picked kind of what your, your the excerpt was going to be, but I think that's another reason to like explore the whole thing because it all kind of informs that last kind of meaty bit. It's kind of how I got there. You yeah. could say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, here I can just read the, yeah. the first. Or I mean, do you want to talk about maybe your background at all, or just like sure, or, so, um, or, where, or where you're coming at it from? Because there's yeah. a lot of yeah, reference yeah, yeah. to psychoanalysis for sure. I think is a big part of it. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm uh, I'm 33 years old now, um, and when I was I want to say 14 or 15 is when I was first introduced to the work of Carl Jung, and Jung. Uh, really represented a lot to me, really kind of was this guiding light for, for much of, of my life from that point on. Um, here was somebody who um, symbolized all the mysteries of life and the depths of life and all of the, the confusions. I mean, especially as a teenager, all of the, the confusion that you, you go through and trying to find your place in the world and learning and so much learning that's going on and, and just figuring things out. and. Um, Jung represented, I mean, at one level, somebody from a totally different world to me, uh, but also so much closer. You know, I, I later read kind of the pantheon or the canon of, you know, psychoanalysts and decided to go back and read Freud and, and, and found a lot of joy in, in that. And I, maybe 10 years or so in my 20s, I got into uh, Jacques Lacan, the, the, the French, uh, you know, psychoanalyst. And I, I really enjoyed his work, and I, I reference him in this. But but really, Jung was the first one for me, um, just kind of as this representative of what uh, a life could be. That's exploring, um, you know, like, like you said about the zine, how you wanted to explore things that aren't usually talked about. I mean, that's so much of what psychoanalysis is, and that's whether it's Jung or Freud or you know any of them. I mean, Freud was very controversial in his time because we had all these puritanical. Victorian kind of, um, you know, these mores and values in, in society that, you know, here's Freud saying these really, uh, these things that really shook a lot of people up, very shocking things. And um, for Jung, it was the same, you know, here, here's someone talking about um, all of these rich images that, um, you know, I, I I learned early on that these aren't just abstract concepts that, that you know, archetypes are are living things, so to speak, and that they can take hold of you. And the idea of possession, you know, it gives us a whole vocabulary for, uh, you know, understanding. You know, maybe I'm a teenager and I'm getting really angry, and all I really have to work with in my, you know, vocabulary of anger is these kind of pat explanations. And then I read Jung, and he talks about being possessed by the shadow, or he talks about very specific images of it, and the sulfur, and the fire, and the, you know, and you start to get mm. into these rich kind of elemental images, and they, they really spoke to me and gave me a whole uh, vocabulary around that. Um, and then, you know, in the context of this essay, I, I drew a, a lot from Lacan, because I would say that Lacan is the one who really ran with Freud in the focus on language, that for Jung, you know, language is important, but the images are so important. The archetypal images are a big part of what Jung is all about. And for Lacan, it's very much wordplay. And I mean, so much of Lacan is so dense because of the layers of wordplay he's using. And, you know, when he talks about the symptom that you have, he also calls it um, Saint Homme, which is the French for the, the saintly man who saves you. And he calls it the Synth Homme, like the synthetic man, the synthetic person. You know, he's doing so much wordplay. And, um, there is so much, I mean, you almost, you can read Jung and he's, and he's trying to, you know, Jung will give you these rich images, but he, he presents them at least in a way that you can follow to a degree where he's saying, you know, this is Mercurius, this is the, the patron saint of, you know, so on, and this is, you know, whatever it is, if you want the image of masculinity that we've inherited, you can talk about these various masculine archetypes or the images of femininity we've inherited, all these things, or the shadow. And mm -hmm. When you're talking about Lacan, it's hard to even know what he's saying. There's so much disagreement because it's it's so layered um, and it's so... But then at the same time, once you, you kind of see where he's going with it, it, it really sticks. There's something about the, the wordplay and the language that, um, 
you know, one of my favorite Lacan stories from his practice was that um, he was treating a woman who, uh, whose family was actually taken away in World War II by the Gestapo at 6 a.m. And she was having this traumatic trigger every morning at 6 a.m. She would, you know, have these terrible memories of it. And um, at one point he made an you know, intervention with her, which is that um, she was talking about it and he reached out and brushed her, her cheek with his hand. And she immediately understood there's a term in French, the geste à which is the gesture of kindness. And hmm. it was this gesture of delicate, kind of gentle kindness. And it, in a way it linked the signifier Gestapo to the signifier, uh, you know, geste à peau. And so she had a totally different, um, reaction and a different relationship to to that whole memory and that whole trauma and so you know this is a great example of the different approaches um, kind of working through the images or working through the the words you know and um, and so so yeah so I mean I, I guess my my background I mean I'm very um, much an avid reader of psychoanalysis and I also love philosophy and um, but I, I really went kind of from Jung more towards towards Lacan, okay. um, and and also incorporating other other psychoanalysts and other writers. As far as just Jung and Lacan, because I feel like it's gonna come up. I I, I understand Jung a bit more because when I met you, that's you really got me into kind of um, Jungian psychology and all that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I feel like for Jung, there's like a very like clear sense of like what's driving people and it's just kind of like archetypal almost like collective unconscious sort of forces mm -hmm. that are like kind of driving people in certain ways or to act in certain ways or to take on certain um, demeanors or moods mm -hmm. um, do you feel like there's a similar thing in Lacan or is Lacan like is language almost like another agent in some way because what, what I kept coming up against was like especially in your in your essay is like is there something like kind of a bit more uh, primordial that's like taking force and trying to come out through subtext or is it like language is this like is subtext just kind of this like leftover bit of that language and words are like unable to kind of just use or is, is it yeah I, I think those are both valid i think for for young um the focus is definitely going to be on these sort of inexpressible archetypes that um color everything so that if you're possessed by a certain complex, you know, the, the whole subtext of everything you express is going to, in some ways, express that. So if you're in a foul shadow mood, you know, you might say, good to see you, but the subtext is, it's bad to see you, because, you know, the way you're saying it, okay, and the yeah. way you're delivering it is being motivated by this inner complex that's taken But that's clearly coming from the person, right? Sure. And not the language, necessarily. Yeah, yeah, okay. but, um, but then I think for, for Lacan, there's going to be more of a focus on how... Um, you know, how language is something that we enter into and that we are all at one point in our lives pre-linguistic. And you could say pre-linguistic subjects, but in a way we're not even yet subjects because our subjectivity is, is you know, inextricably linked to this moment of entering into language. And so as small babies and, you know, we're starting to use language, we kind of immediately um, enter into, there's all these peculiar rules about language. Um, and, and very specific rules that we don't necessarily understand, but we, we learn, we learn those rules. And so we learn, um, you know, um, it's a very, uh, you know, Lacanian idea that um, we, we associate, we identify with certain words and those words become very sensitive to us. And I, I think Jung was aware of this too. I mean, this, this does go back to Freud and Jung, of course, um, was a disciple of Freud, but also Jung was independent, at least in the beginning. You know, Jung's first major contribution to psychoanalysis was the free association experiment, where everyone's kind of heard of this, where, you know, the you know analyst says a word and you say the first word that pops into your head. And what people sometimes don't realize about that is that it's not the content of the association that you're looking for. It's, you know, I say one word and you say another, I say another word, you say another, and we keep going back and forth. And then eventually I'll say a word where you won't have an immediate association. It's actually the lack of the immediate association. You hmm. know, I say tree, and you say cat, and I say house, and you say dog, and I say mother, and oh, silence, you know, or something like that, right? Okay. And, and that, but, or it doesn't have to be that, but you know, it can be, um, it can be a certain word that maybe I even suspect is something that um, 
was a signifier that may have brought shame or embarrassment to you when you were younger, maybe a nickname you had, or something that's traumatic to you, a traumatic signifier that was attached to you. And you always hated being called that, or it's associated with this traumatic experience. And when I say that word, suddenly there's silence. There's no, there's no association in it. So it's almost like you're, you're looking and you're finding where, okay, okay, yeah. there's, a, there's a strong one. You know, there's yeah. a strong emotionally charged word. So Jung himself came up with this independent of, of any work with Freud. That was, in fact, his contribution that kind of garnered Freud's attention um, that he came up with on his own. And Freud very much appreciated that. And I, I would say that there is this foundation all the way back to Freud of kind of realizing that words can become emotionally charged. Um, the thing for Lacan is that Lacan is very, very cognizant of the difference between the imaginal, what he calls the imaginary, which even that is kind of a way of framing what Jung would, would, would call the imaginal in a way of demeaning it or diminishing its importance, and what Lacan calls the symbolic. And the symbolic is really the, the words. And so, um, you know, for, for Lacan, um, these words can be so powerful and so important, and we, all of our desire is really based around words. We think we desire the thing itself, but what we might actually desire is something else entirely that's, that's part of this language game where, um, you know, there's a lot of complexity there. It's like, um, maybe for Jung, you know, um, you're identified with a certain image, and that image is, uh, informing your decisions that you make and that image is inf and this would be an archetypal image you know if, if i'm identified with the image of the eternal youth i'm going to have a lot of problems with, with with growing old but for lacan it's actually that we're identified with certain words what, what you would call signifiers and part of the the you know work of analysis is to uncover these words to to get the client to cough them up so to speak and to discover what those words are and so we can kind of remove some of the power that those words have so in the example I gave earlier, the word, uh, you know, Gestapo, that's a very powerful word for somebody who's had a, tra a traumatic experience, you know, related to, to, to the Gestapo. And maybe for Jung, it might be particular images that hmm. are so crucial, but, but for Lacan and probably for Freud also, it's, it's the words. So um, these two levels of image and language, you know, they, they do, there's a lot of interplay. I mean, we talk about images and, and words give us images in our mind and they're, you know, um, there's, there's definitely, um, it goes both ways, you know, um, and it's interesting to see what, what is primary in some sense, and even if that's even the, the right question. I mean, um, the interesting, um, the interesting one for me is, is James Hillman, who was, uh, I also mentioned in the essay, who was uh, a post-Jungian, really the first post-Jungian, in the sense that he distanced himself from Jung to a bit, because, you know, a bit, because he felt that Jung was actually being overly conceptual, you know, in a way overly linguistic, because Jung was talking about the word self and the word shadow and the word hmm. anima and, and, and all these words, which, whereas for Jung, certainly they represented images. What Hillman would say is that, well, the problem with so, so many Jungians is, you know, you have a dream of a snake and they say, oh, the snake symbolizes your shadow. Well, that's taking the image, the dream image, and you're immediately jumping back out into language. And Hillman wanted to ask, you know, what kind of snake was it? What was it doing? What okay. color were its scales? I mean, it's an interesting question, but it's the great quote from Hillman is that um, we have it backwards when we think that the world of images is so vague and imprecise and that we need to get to the precision of language. In fact, it's language that's imprecise. Hmm. That images themselves are the most precise and that language can only ever be an approximation, you know, a generalization and, you know, or, you know, an approximation of the image. So I, I think ultimately both are valid approaches and they, they do intersperse and obviously we communicate with words, we're using words right now. And, yeah. and we can also communicate using words in an imaginal way by, um, you know, by providing rich images that you, that you can think of. So by using stories, I mean, we're definitely storytellers. Um, you know, in some ways, psychoanalysis came out of the rich tradition that humanity has always had of, of storytelling, of, of narrative, and of having people narrate them, their, their own stories and then seeing what that narrative is and kind of making it, you know, changing that narrative or doing things to unsettle that narrative so that it, it's not so fixed. You know, someone goes into, into their first session and they have 
this fixed narrative of their life. And this is who I am, and this is where I come from, and this is my origin, and this is what life has been to me. And part of the role of, of the analyst is to kind of loosen that that fixed narrative so that new narratives can, can emerge. And I don't think we ever ultimately get out of narrative. I mean, I, I think part of the the beauty of it is is not that the fictions are bad or that the narratives are bad. It's that we sometimes just need new fictions and we need new hmm. new stories. And that's in fact a lot of what I guess shouldn't hold us back. Or anything. Well, that's what the role of culture is is to provide us with new stories of ways of living, of ways of being. That's what art does. That's what music and film and all of these things. And so it's like someone who's you know oftentimes this is when someone first goes to college or they move from the country to a big city or they, they are exposed to some people from different walks of life or something and suddenly their world is opened up with all of these new narratives and I think that um, a big part of you know uh, psychoanalysis isn't to get to this post narrative place where I don't have a narrative because that's even then there's the narrative of just not having it you know <laughs> it's really just to loosen up our um, fixation on, on, on particular stories and to open it up and and I think just to bring it back to subtext that subtext can be very subversive in this in this regard because I can go to a, to a therapist I can tell them here's my narrative this is who I am this is my life this is my origin and they might notice the subtext but not only do they notice certain subtextual Freudian slips or certain things that I'm saying or doing what they'll do is amplify them they'll draw my attention to them and so it's very subversive because I have my okay. surface story and yeah. then here they are zooming in and focusing and not letting me you know I'm giving some example and then they say well you know what, what is it about that example in particular I say oh you know no no that's fine let's do a different example and it's like no <laughs> I'm not gonna let you choose a different example because there was a reason you chose that one gotcha, yeah. pretending that it's just an example but it actually carried some rich subtextual so in a way psychoanalysis deals with kind of subtextual yeah um, should, should we begin do you have a, a few more notes or what are you, um, I don't know if you want to do a close reading first and then go back through my response or we can just kind of go through the whole thing or... yeah I can just start I mean you can jump in with any responses you have I can just kind of start with uh, it doesn't have to be we don't have to read the whole thing but I'll just kind of go through some of the main parts so so how I began was with the the distinction between text and subtext so I basically start with the idea that the text is the explicit message of the language used and so it's it's the official story it's the cover story and it's it's sort of um, there's an implicit consensus that, that anyone in this conversation can kind of you know we, we can all agree this is all, almost our rationale or our reason for talking it's the official sort of it's a, it's a cover story and then the subtext is all the communicate all, all of that communication which uh, occurs beneath, uh, around, and in the peripheries. So this was kind of my way of saying um, everything that's that's not the official story. That's almost everything that's deniable. You know, the phrasing, the way things are said. Um, I made a reference to the lived duration of the experience of relating, which you kind of um, previously. I know in a previous conversation you drew the connection to Bergson because yeah. I used the word duration, and I was very much thinking Bergson. You know, Henri Bergson is the great philosopher of, of uh, duration who wanted us to really pay attention to the quality of, of the time passing and the, the rhythms of it and not simply thinking of time as a quantity but what, what is its quality you know I mean if you read the transcript you might get you know the official story but how was the person saying it what was their body language what yeah. was the quality what was the actual lived experience of being in that conversation yeah. with that person what was well, I think I think a good way uh, to think about it and kind of what I um, reacted to was yeah definitely I pulled out the Bergson and I definitely thought about that when I was thinking about subtext as well because it's kind of about our like failure to kind of really say everything mm -hmm. um, and like the text I, I think about it in a way um, as far as like it's kind of the the legal transcript in a way it's like mm -hmm. what we can point to for evidence like mm -hmm. you said this like that's my evidence like I don't know I can't know what you're thinking like I, you said this and that's you know, mm -hmm. that's going to back mm -hmm. up my claim or whatever. And like, definitely when Bergson talks about duration, it's, you, the narr you can say, like, the ball rolled down the hill. And like, that gives you, a, you know, the ball at the top of the hill, the ball at the bottom of the hill. But mm -hmm. there's all these moments in between that like, aren't encompassed. And then 
that kind of just initially points to like you can start dissecting it more and more and like Bergson goes into this about duration is like you can start mapping out the curve and everything like that as the ball rolls down the hill but like there's still more and more that can never be said you'll it's never like exhaust constantly it. reaching yeah right you'll never exhaust it and yet Bergson always kind of pays pays an homage to the um, poets for saying that poets are the ones who can get it in a flash but I mean I mean again they can never say all of it but they can give you an intuition of it and that intuition of it is so different than the technical description I mean I love Bergson's quip that um, a scientist can tell you uh, all about a sugar cube and they can tell you that sugar cubes configuration of molecules or atoms or all these things and its consistency and its weight and size and height and width and all these things and uh, but a poet can tell you the sugar cubes way of being uh, so he says, I, I, I must wait for the sugar to dissolve. Meaning I have to watch it dissolve and hmm. see how it interacts over time and watch the experience yeah, of Yeah, the experience of, of, like, is very key. Of its duration. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a rhythm to it, there's a speed of it, there's all these things. And yeah, I mean, that's something, you're reading a transcript, you're not getting the speed, even, of the language. You're not yeah. getting, are they talking slow, are they talking fast? You're not getting the, the timbre of the voice. Um, you know, someone can... Um, can say uh, say they're sorry, but if they if they apologize with you know there's a sincere tone of voice and an insincere tone of voice. Sarcasm sarcasm doesn't doesn't come across in the transcript, yeah. um, and even still it can be hard to know if someone's being sarcastic or not. Um, you know that yeah. So very much um, so the the subtext I, I was kind of just saying this is everything that's beneath, uh, around and in the peripheries and and really you know we could add a lot of other other words there, but it's trying to just kind of get across it's everything besides the, the cover story. So then I go on to the idea of pleasure. I say, what pleasure there is in language? Not only the intellectual stimulation of wordplay, of double entendres, nor the erotic thrill of a sexual provocation, but even the glee of complicity itself, the complicity with the official narrative, and the complicity among those who pretend to agree to such a narrative. And here I'm saying that there's, there's enjoyment on both sides. There's enjoyment you know, I'm, I'm mentioning sexual provocation, I, I mean, you know, flirting. There's enjoyment with flirting, there's enjoyment with wordplay, but there's also enjoyment, you know, here I'm kind of almost thinking, um, I'm thinking like, let's imagine like a, a fascist kind of dictatorship. Let's imagine Stalin or something talking and Stalin is saying, you know, um, I speak on behalf of my people and there's someone in the audience who says but I disagree with you and then he says but you're not my people and there's a complicity that the the pro Stalin people in that room can have of being like but I am one of his people so huh. I can agree with this official narrative and we can kind of you know or maybe that's not the best example but it's really it's there's a glee where you know say there's a bunch of people who are kind of an in-group or a clique and they've all agreed that you know it, it can work a lot of different ways they can agree that um so when they adopt this, this other person's an, an out yeah. group, yeah, and they can also all agree that even though one person's saying, no, no, of course we accept you in our in-group, and the other one says, yeah, of course we do, what's wrong with you? And the next person says, yeah, you must just be crazy if you think that we don't accept you, and they're all kind of taking this this glee in in the, you know, what's often called gaslighting of the person, huh. you know. Um, so I'm being a little bit dark there, but I'm saying that there's enjoyment on both sides. There's enjoyment um, of subversion in the sort of subtext subversion, but there's also enjoyment of uh, fighting against the subversive elements and kind of maintaining the status quo and, and maintaining the official story. Yeah, and being that. a part of that connection. Yeah, yeah. Being, being a part. You know, there's the glee and the complicity of, of the official narrative. Um, so then I have the example of emotional cheating. And I was saying that this is an interesting one. You know, everyone knows what, what cheating is in a couple, and that's um, that you can kind of... But when it's emotional cheating, I mean, first of all, this is an interesting idea that's only probably entered into pop culture lexicon in the last 20 years or something. You know, maybe since the 70s, I don't know. But, but there's this whole idea that um, it's, you know, shared intimacy or flirtation or things like that with uh, with someone that's kind of deniable in a way. I mean, I've, I guess at certain points it can be undeniable, but there's quite a lot of deniability. Um, there can be, uh, you know, hypocrisy there. So I say that it can, it can become an erotic game, a heightening of erotic excitement through prolonged deferral of satisfaction. The man may tell his wife that any uh, erotic undertones between him and the other woman is purely her imagination. This is again the, the gaslighting. Not only does he take pleasure in continuing the game with the other woman, 
um, he, he takes immense pleasure, perhaps, perhaps not even realizing it, in his own torturous behavior of his own wife. So that there's a double pleasure here. There's the pleasure of the, it's like it's even pleasurable, and this is a very dark idea. This is kind of, again, from you know, psychoanalysis, where we get all sorts of dark ideas. That someone's complaining and they say they've lost all pleasure. Well, they might take tremendous pleasure in complaining. Well, similarly, there can be this pleasure, this kind of you know, illicit thrill of, of transgressing, of breaking the rule, of breaking the agreement. But then there's even more pleasure in denying it. In mm. sort of torturing the other, there, there can be, you know, it can be this, you know. So this is a very dark, very dark <laughs> idea here. Um, the pleasure is not merely in heightening the uh, erotic enjoyment of the bard other, the uh, woman. It is first and foremost the pleasure of playing a game with his own wife's sanity, a game which may even turn deadly, as the tragic results of so many love affairs have shown us. So this is this is probably the darkest I get in the essay <laughs> here. But, you but know, I mean, I, I think it very much points out, like, I mean, especially in terms of like cheating, like I think it it's a good example because people think of cheating, they try and think of like some act, some act mm -hmm. that like they can mm -hmm. point to to be like, this is how you cheated on me. And with emotional cheating, it is very difficult, right? Because there's that deniability. So I mean, I, I won't say it's worse, but in some ways, it's it's a relief to be able to point to it and say you cheated, and that's that. And it's it's crazy making to say you cheated. And the person says, No, I didn't. There's nothing you can point to. There's no you know yeah. read the official transcript. There's exactly. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there's nothing you can point to in the transcript. It's very legalistic, and it can it can really drive people crazy. It's that that gaslighting. Yeah, um, and I think that I mean that points to more how like subtext brings up kind of bigger things or maybe worse like there's a bit more weight to it when you can't just like point to something I think and you talk about how mm -hmm. yeah you can get joy in the fact that like you're kind of playing the game a little bit better like yeah I'm not saying we should get joy yeah. from this I mean <laughs> yeah. in fact a lot of you know psychoanalysis there's a great quip from uh, Lacan where he said People have so many defenses when, when they come in to, to the you know analyst, and the defenses are there for good reason because the analyst is trying to rob them of their enjoyment. So if someone comes mm -hmm. in and they're complaining and they're denying the fact that they tremendously enjoy complaining, and what the analyst is trying to do is to basically break something in that mechanism so that they no longer enjoy it. It's like literally to rob them of their enjoyment so they can't uh, enjoy anymore in, huh. that, in that way. Because you know it's telling us that some enjoyments are better left uh, <laughs> not enjoyed, so to speak. Um, so, so after this I moved to something, I, I didn't really give him credit here, but I mean it's kind of a basic enough psychoanalytic notion. I, I say we don't get to choose what we mean. And that's something that, that it sounds simple enough, like okay, yeah, I don't really get to choose what I mean, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's controversial. I go on to say that's an inflammatory statement. Um, you know, what do you mean I don't get to choose what I mean? I'm telling you. You know, and, and we always think we're telling people what we mean. And all we can really do is appeal to them and to, we can try to explain what we mean and we can, what we think we mean. But this is, you know, this is a really interesting point. So Lacan's um, nephew, who's one of the translators of a lot of his work, Jacques Alain Miller, spelled like Miller, uh, you know, Jacques Alain Miller, he, um, he's the one that, I, that really phrased it the best to me, where he said, um, this is paraphrasing, but he said, um, it always seems that the speaker has the power, but that's not the case. The listener has the power because the listener has the power to say what the speaker means. And, you know, it gets into a lot of complexity because, well, what if different listeners think the speaker means different things? But we mm -hmm. can even say that overall that there's a social group that kind of, this is a kind of a social constructivist notion that the social group confers... Um, the, they, they validate. So, you know, what makes someone a good artist? That other good artists say they're a good artist. What makes someone a legitimate writer? That other writers say they're a legitimate writer. And so it, it can be really frustrating in the same way with language. You know, what does this word mean? It means another word. There's this yeah. endless deferral. Who was the original artist? Well, we have to go back a long ways, you know? So it's difficult because it's the same idea that um, ultimately it's, in, you know, psychoanalytic terminology, it, it, it's impotence. It's impotence in the sense that potency is so much around getting to say what you mean and everybody has to kind of submit to that and unless you're a fascist dictator you know even in that case the so-called discourse of the master where the master says this is what I mean and I mean nothing else by it people are still going to whisper and, and talk behind their back well I don't think that's what I mean. you know so it's like there's ultimately there's nothing we can do to really all we can do is appeal 
I shouldn't say there's nothing we can do, but we can't ever say once and for all what we mean. I mean, I can say, this essay means that I believe this and this and this, and you are wrong if you say that I meant something else. But ultimately, I, I can't, you, you know, can't control, control. Yeah. yeah, I cannot <laughs> control all of the meaning that is applied from it. I mean, if somebody reads this and they say, this means that guy's an arrogant jerk, you know, then well, that's, <laughs> what it, that's what it means to them, you know? I mean, I can't control that. I can't control how I'm seen, so. But would you say in that case then that language is like a adversarial effort in some ways, or is it cooperative? Because it, it sounds in that case that there is this like, points of conflict that can come up when it comes to language but there's there's definitely it, conflict around what it means you know and that's there's a, that's a big conflict I mean it's around and I think that there's ways to get around this and to kind of subvert that battle for mastery I mean I think a big part of psychoanalysis is not directly challenging any of that but subverting it sidestepping it and it's it's almost like the move where someone says well you know that so here's a side point is kind of um, just about language problems you know um, someone might say, well, that's not real freedom. And, that, and then someone else goes, no, it is true freedom. You don't understand. That's not true. And, you know, they're arguing over whether, whether it's such and such is a true example of freedom. You know, the communist says, true freedom is freedom from capitalist exploitation. And the capitalist says, true freedom is freedom from, from market restriction. And they're arguing over what's true freedom. And, you know, if the point of the psychoanalyst who tries to position themselves in this sort of subversive place is to never directly confront, but to rather, you know, um, subvert and to kind of destabilize these fixed meanings. So someone goes in and they have a very fixed meaning and they say, this is the only true freedom. And you want to kind of destabilize that signifier to hmm. signified relationship. The word freedom means X. And you want it to also be able to mean Y or Z or to be able to, to kind of loosen it to the point where a person can understand that we all use words in different ways and that, you know, and, and you, you really want to make sure that you're not just arguing over, well, first of all, I think arguing in general is kind of pointless. Like, you're right, there is a lot of conflict in language, but it's always pointless. It doesn't really, it's nothing new. I mean, what we're actually looking for is, is something novel, is novelty. And so you go into you know psychoanalysis and you're ready to have the same conversation you've had a hundred times over. It's this kind of repetition compulsion and you, you always end up having the same fight and you always end up sabotaging in the same way and you end up with these endless loops. And so what the, what the analyst is trying to do is to try to introduce something new that kind of prevents that, that you know, thing from repeating. But yeah, it can be very adversarial and I, I think we should not take the bait, you know, if, if someone's arguing with us and saying, you're missing what I'm meaning, that's not what I mean at all. We should just, instead of saying, no, you're wrong, I, I, that is what you mean, we should kind of, you know, we ultimately have the power as listeners to decide what they mean. And that doesn't mean we have to tell them. Okay. <laughs> we can simply, you know, we can even use, you know, in some ways we can use subtext to simply say, all right, I accept that. And then they'll pick up on the subtext that, well, yeah, they accept it, but you know, I'm now, I've lost some of the power that I thought I had, or I'm, you know, huh, yeah. it's, so it's, it's, uh, but again, I mean, it's, yeah, it can definitely be adversarial. There's so many battles around, around language and around what words mean. And, um, think of, I mean, God, there's so many, so much struggle. I mean, it is a battleground. Language is a battleground. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is actually part of, I think I kind of sectioned your essay out a little bit, and this is all part of the part where I feel like you talk about power most, which is kind of the first figure mm -hmm. um, of subtext that you kind of bring up. Mm -hmm. um, and then you talk about how it's, um, it, like, language symbolically castrates us in some way, mm -hmm. which is maybe a term that you can unpack a little bit. But Well, yeah, it's it's the very much the same thing I was talking about using the, the, the term, you know, impotence is, is the same kind of thing because the idea of, of castration here, of symbolic castration is... Um, is that, um, you know, there's, this again goes back to Freud and back to, you know, psychoanalysis and this idea that um, when we, uh, b before we fully enter into language, we have these feelings of omnipotence, of all powerfulness, and we kind of feel like gods. This is as little babies, you know, you can see a little baby feeling like a god. It's, 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 it's you know, enfant terrible or whatever it is. And, um, and that when we enter into language, the castrating effect is basically we have to give up that those fantasies of omnipotence, and we have to accept that I'm not everything. I'm just a I'm just a person, and more than just a person, I'm I'm a man. For instance, I'm castrated by the fact that 
I, I can't necessarily, no matter how much I just, I want to choose my gender and maybe I identify as a different gender or identify as, as no gender, who knows what, you know, society will see me a certain way and that is the symbolic castration. And maybe I really see myself as a country western musician and I put out an album and they say, no, that's not country western, that's, you know, classical. And I say, no, it's country western. I mean, that's not the best example. But, you know, <laughs> there's always going to be something where I see myself a certain way and unless that's validated by society, you know, I'm going to feel powerless, powerless to convince them that I really am the thing that I, that I am. And there's a tremendous frustration there. And that's, that gets at this symbolic castration. It's, it's castration because so much of psychoanalysis talks about the phallus. And I mean, it gets quite dense in, in metaphor. I mean, yeah, that's, that's symbolic and, in its own. Yeah. And it's, but it's the idea that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's even that the child, whether boy or girl, um, who finds out that the mother doesn't have the phallus, identifies as the phallus themselves, and that the mothers oftentimes will use their children as a sort of phallus in, in many ways to kind of say, you don't know what it's like. You can't speak because you're not a mother. Hmm. And so it's that is always the wielding the phallus, um, this idea that trying to assert Which is like authority power, power yeah influence. asserting authority or asserting power and asserting that the other person cannot speak because they don't have that experience you know well you're not x therefore you cannot speak of this uh, your your opinion is invalid here and that's that's very much someone who has not fully experienced the symbolic castration you know their their relation to language is very much th through the imaginary and it's going to be through what um, you know Lacan calls empty speech. And you know we all know empty speech when we see it. It's the speech that when someone's talking and they're kind of, um, you know, I think of the end of Training Day, and I think of um, uh, Denzel Washington's character, and he has that famous "I am King Kong" speech. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you seen that? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Well, he's he's lost all his power. He was a very powerful man, and he's a corrupt police officer, and and finally. You know, he's had all his power through all the terror he's inflicted. He's almost like a like a petty fascist or something, you know. Okay. If anyone spoke out against him, he'd have them killed or he'd have them ostracized from the community. And everyone's always supported him in that. And he's had all this symbolic power. And then at the end, he's, you know, he owes all this money to these mobsters and they're going to come and kill him. And usually he would be protected, but everybody's turned on him. They don't like him anymore. And so he's standing in the middle of the street and he's saying, don't you all know? I'm King Kong, and he's beating his chest, and he's like showing, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. It's like what, you know, Zizek says, the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Zizek, he said, um, you know, real authority is, is through a look, it's through a glance. You know, if, if the father has authority, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, I mean, obviously there's a lot of problems with, you know, patriarchy and authority here, but if the father really has authority, he doesn't have to say, I'm the authority, don't you? He doesn't raise his hand, he doesn't his, raise his voice, he doesn't hit his children. That beating, beating your children as a way of ostensibly asserting authority is actually revealing your impotence. It's revealing your complete lack of power and lack of authority. Huh. You come across as a clown, you come across as, you know, and everyone, you know, no matter how much there, there's a physical pain involved, there's always this sort of grim satisfaction in, oh, I made you crack, I made you break. And so you see Denzel Washington's character, and he's been so cool and calm and collected throughout the film, and that's when he has power. He has power when someone starts to speak up, and he just looks at them, and his glance, they shut right up, you know? But then yeah. at the end, when he's totally lost his cool, and he's beating his chest, and I am King Kong, and, you know, he's trying to, that's him face to face with the symbolic castration, and that's him saying empty speech. They're all empty words. I am the power. I have all the power. Don't you know? I'll destroy all of you. It's empty. They're empty threats. Huh. There's nothing to back it up. There is no power there. It's the last gasps of a desperate attempt to cling to a power one no, no, no longer has. So because, that, seemed, yeah. that seemed to say, like, on its own, that, like, language and words in and of themselves don't necessarily have power, would you say? Or? Well, I mean, that's maybe the distinction between full speech and empty speech, but, okay. but I mean, uh, I think power is, is going to be... Like, I mean, if you, there's speech without anything to back it up, though. Well, like, yeah, and, and it's also, it's not the individual's language that has power, it's the collective and how the collective, I mean, all the power of the king is because everyone bows down to them, you know, the power of the priest is because everyone listens to him and worships the god that they ostensibly speak on behalf of, and so there's really, it's the power in numbers kind of thing, I mean... You know, money is only valuable because we all agree it is. And so there's all these 
there's a sort of consensus reality that, that we agree to that confers power to people and that's where their power lies, at least in this sense of power. I mean, we can talk about personal power and other things, but, you know, I mean, in this context, I would say that um, the full speech is, it isn't even having to make the threat, it's the full speech is really being able to talk in such a way that one doesn't even have to talk about power. They simply, you know, um, you know, it's, someone's someone's talking to you and, and saying, you know, you know, what are you going to do? And you say, I think I'll have a cup of tea or something, you know, mm -hmm. because you have the privilege to do that. And the subtext there is that this is so insignificant to me. I don't even have to uh, to to do, you know, like. So it's really it's the, it's the funny thing that the more you directly assert something, the less power it has. In some ways when something is spoken in language, it loses a lot of power, and that's something mm -hmm. that I, I also talk about a little bit, about how when the subtext is brought to the level of the text, when yeah. it's explicitly stated, it loses its power, it loses its potency. And the idea here is almost like a psychic tension, like a, a psychological tension, an inner tension that, that can build up, that can be felt, and so it's maybe there's flirtation going on you know, between two people, and there's this kind of sexual tension that builds up, and then as soon as they start talking about it, it all goes away. I mean, the, the surefire way to, uh, to relieve sexual tension is to, to talk about sex. It's not sexy to talk about sex. It mm -hmm. actually removes all of the sexiness from it the more you talk about it. So it, it depotentiates it, you know, and that's... And that's uh, one of the big things I feel like that I kept coming back to and um, a few other pieces touched on as well is just that it's all the stuff that we don't talk about that really connects us to people, it seems, that like... It's, it's the fact that you don't have to say things necessarily to show that, like a deeper connection between people, people who don't have to be very explicit, who can like communicate through maybe even just like grunts or looks or like mm -hmm. there's, there's more communication going on and that kind of shows like how rich the subtext is and how, shows how rich the connection between those people are. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it creates those connections. Well, and it's, it can be a communication through um shorthand in a way too and that's the other that's the other thing you know there's a great Deleuze quote and I almost just looked it up but I think it would be too hard to find right now but uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze the, the French philosopher he said um, you know we have such a focus nowadays and this was probably said in the 70s or 80s or something but he was saying basically there's such a focus on expression express yourself and communicate and he said there's nothing worse than those the the couple who is having a fight or, or you know whatever it is and they say just say something just talk you know, as if talking, as if the problem is that they're not talking yeah. enough, they're not expressing enough. The problem is never that, that you're not talking enough, not expressing enough. The problem is that um, it's already lost if you've kind of, you know, we, we can distinguish between um, sort of discussion and conversation. And usually we use these words, in, you know, interchangeably, but just for the sake of this example, let's say that discussion is... Um, you know, and it, maybe it's not, it's even a spectrum, that a discussion is meant yeah, for a wider like audience. And so, that, yeah. so we're, so you, you and I, you, Alex Fry, me, me uh, you know, Jonah Dempsey, we're having a conversation, but we have to have a certain element of discussion because we can't only speak in our shorthand because this is recorded and this is for a larger audience. And so it's necessarily going to hamper our ability to communicate because if we're communicating just to each other in conversation, we can use all the shorthands that are kind of available to us. Mm -hmm. we, can refer we can reference anything from a previous conversation. You know, I can just start a sentence and stop halfway through because you know exactly where I'm going yeah. with it. But when it's discussion, it's always for a larger audience, and so it's kind of reduced, you know, in a way. And so, so much of the, the problem is that we end up in, in having conversations that aren't really conversations because we can't really communicate because either somebody else is there and we feel like we have to explain things for them or it's for a larger group. or So there's always this struggle, and I don't mean to say it, it's bad, but just there's always sort of a, we're being held back by our ability, you know, we can't just use everything that's available to us because I have things that I can refer to that you know that a third person would have no, no kind of awareness of. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, but yeah, it's a really great quote it, from Deleuze. And that just kind of gets yeah. worse, like the further from, so obviously with you yourself, there is no, there's obviously no need to talk, but like you can use the most short of hand possible. And then with an intimate person or someone you know very well, like that, that common lexicon even, or just like that. Right, yeah, right. And we, we know what the words mean to each other and we have a feeling for what those words mean and we can, we can share so many things. I mean, um, that's kind of an interesting, uh, 
I, I do think we communicate more, not less. I mean, maybe in some sense we would communicate more and less than, than we think we do, but I think it's, it's really on the side of more. I mean, there is this idea that's very popular among kind of analytic philosophers and kind of neo-rationalists that, that we can't always, that we, we think we're communicating more than we really are, but you can never really know my experience and I can never really know your mm -hmm. experience. But I always say, you know, even if I have a unique solitary experience that I can never share with you and you have a unique solitary experience you can never share with me, we are automatically sharing the inability to share that experience with each other. Yeah. Even, at, even at that basic level, we can have a certain empathy because we each share the frustration of not being able to directly express everything we want to express. Or there's always this, I mean, you mentioned earlier that subtext is like the uh, remainder. And I definitely think, I don't know if that was the word you used, but it's basically mm -hmm. that it's, it's the leftover or it's the extra, it's the thing that can't be expressed uh, just in the words. And, um, you know, there's always that kind of leftover, that frustration, that overabundance of signification that we, we feel like we need to continue signifying and we can talk endlessly and never reach it, you know, yeah. <laughs> just like we can describe the ball rolling endlessly and yeah. never yeah. actually get to the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, psychoanalysis teaches us that the speaker is ultimately powerless. Yeah, this is where we, uh, where we were kind of talking about yeah. uh, the listener gets to decide what the speaker means. Uh, and then the impotence of the speaker when it comes to deciding their meaning is symbolic castration. Um, and I do a little bit of wordplay here. It's not merely that the castration is symbolic in the sense of metaphorical. I mean, it is that, obviously. We're talking about a, a metaphorical castration. It's not literal. But, but it's also the case that we are castrated by the symbolic order itself, the entire order of symbols the entire discursive field of our society, our social milieu, the way language is used by other people. This is what castrates us. If I do not get to choose what I mean, it also means I don't get to choose who I am or what I am. Such a fact is a terrible blow to the ego. You know, and this is this gets into some controversial territory because, you know, there is this whole idea, I mean, I guess it's commonly called identity politics, but it's the idea that we have the right to choose our identity and that is true. I have the right to assert my choice of identity, but mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, society will talk about me in a certain way that I don't have any say in. And this is what's the terrible blow to my ego, because I can say I'm, I have this or that identity, but people will say, oh, Jonah is a blank who says he's a, you know, he's an X yeah. who says he's a Y. They won't just say I'm a Y. And I can say, no, I'm really Y. I really am. And they'll say, well, okay, you're an X that says you're a Y. Okay. You know, whatever yeah. that happens to be, and that's that's really frustrating. And then you talk about this in terms of like entering into language, right, mm -hmm. in a certain way, and that, and I kind of feel like that's is that like entering into kind of the, the social spheres, like is language and society kind of connected in that way? Like, I mean, obviously you only use language with other people, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think when I say entering into language, I'm thinking like two years old. I mean, I don't, okay. I'm not thinking as an adult, you're going off and, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, we change from pre-linguistic proto-subjects to subjects proper who use language. But then so all of a sudden there's an external, there's an external yeah, view, there's something asserting on you. And we're using language, language to yeah. talk to the, the parents, to the mother, you know, we're saying, um, I'm sorry. Or we're saying, I didn't mean to. I mean, this is one of the first things that we learn. We learn how to use language to basically uh, attest to our good intentions, <laughs> you know? And that's, that, again, goes back to the idea of, of the, the phallus and that we identify as the phallus and we see that, you know, if we don't say we're sorry, the person is disappointed in us or unhappy. And when we say we're sorry, it, it seems good. And we kind of learn these ways of, uh, but at the same time, when we enter into language, we, we get guilt. I mean, we really understand guilt because we have personal responsibility, because we have a name and we have an identity. And all these things kind of go hand in hand. And, um, and yeah, it is very much the, the burgeoning of an awareness of, of the social world. And I think as we grow older, we, we contend with various levels of symbolic castration. I mean, maybe we're protected, but maybe we have a pivotal moment at age five, and then at age eight, and then at age 11, and who knows what, of these kind of yeah. progressive castrations where the first time we realize that we've always been told we're one thing, but everybody else thinks we're something else, or that we've always thought we were just normal, but we are actually, you know, whatever this other word is, you know? Yeah. Um, but, so, that, but I always kind of, or it makes me think of like, like just learning how you exist to a greater degree because you have another perspective which makes me feel like language can still be like this 
kind of more much more cooperative sort of like effort of like building something and I don't know in response to your whole like uh, conversation discussion I, I wrote these questions I was because just um, kind of my personal reflections is kind of how I think about things I just ask myself endless questions about stuff but mm -hmm. um, so I wrote that I, I want to hear more about your idea of conversation we talked about it a little bit already um, how it's distinct from other exchanges and we talked about how it's distinct from discussion um, there was a bit about code that you kind of referenced a little bit which is actually something that came up a lot when we were talking too is mm -hmm. how is subtext different from just like coded language and, mm -hmm. um, but my questions are like what what part does this play like conversations discussions code um, and is there a specific purpose for exchanging words at all like ultimately we're we trying to communicate information which is like very textual or like feelings which is like kind of more on the subtextual side um, are we trying to like reveal ourselves through code which sounds more like this identity politics thing you're talking about where it's like you have a specific identity Mm. And you're trying to use language to explain to people how you are. Well, and that would be like virtue signaling or something, where I'm trying yeah. to signal that I'm a good person. So I say I'm sorry, so I attest to my good intention, so I go out of my way to, to signal how virtuous I am. Because look at me, I give to charity, and I help the needy, and all yeah. these things. And you know, and I, I think that um, all these play a part of it. I, I'll say real quick that I, when, when I talk about code, I often, I pretty much think of... Lacan's work on code where he distinguishes code from language by saying that code is basically how animals communicate. They signal and I mean I know humans are animals but for the, for the sake of this mm -hmm. non-speaking animals mm -hmm. so you communicate through code and that that the, the speaking animal the human uh, communicates through language and that with code you can you can either be honest or you can deceive. I mean, animals do deceive. They give the code, I'm not here, but they're actually there, you know, by showing something that makes it appear they're not there. So they give the wrong code, but they only have one level of deception. And what's really interesting is that humans, with language, it gets so complex, this endless deferral, we can pretend to pretend. We can deceive as a way of telling the truth. I mean, hmm. there's a, you know... Um, an episode of Sopranos where uh, you know Tony goes to his mistress's house because she says she's suicidal, and when he gets there, she has roses and wine, and she's not suicidal at all. So he says, you know, what is this? You pretended to be suicidal. She signaled that she was suicidal, but she wasn't. Yeah. Then he leaves, and she kills herself. So you know she was pretending to be suicidal when she actually was, in fact. Or um, huh. maybe a less dark example um, from my own personal life. My my grandfather. He'll dress up as Santa Claus from for, for my you know younger brother and sister, and he'll make a big deal about it like, oh I have to put on this costume and I don't want to do this, and then he puts it on and then they come over and he's the nicest person and he hmm. really seems to be having a great time with it, and in fact he is but but it's, and then he takes them all off after they leave and oh yeah it was miserable <laughs> you know and so in a way he's he's pretending it's like so many layers of yeah, pretense. Yeah, yeah. It's layers of pretense. Like he pretends to pretend in order to do the actual thing yeah. himself. Like he wants to have an actual bonding experience with his grandkids, yeah. but he can't admit it. So first he he has to pretend he doesn't like it. Then he has to pretend he likes it while yeah. he's pretending he doesn't like it. Which lets him have the experience. Which lets him actually yeah. have the experience that he wants. So so this is how Lacan distinguishes language. Um, now as for the purpose, I mean yeah, there absolutely is all sorts of signaling and power games and this and that, but I don't think, I mean, I'm very romantic, I guess, in this sense, that I think with empty speech, yeah, there's all this, 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 you know, sort of establishing power or, you know, trying to find viable sexual partners or, you know, all of this kind of competitive game. But again, I, and even speaking to your notion of cooperation, I am very romantic here and very much um, almost, you know, um, I believe that there is a sort of ability to share and this cooperation there's there's empowering each other there's um you know i like what james hillman says where he says not just any talk is conversation that that conversation elevates things inside of you it elevates the soul it elevates it takes you not I mean, not to use this metaphor of, of raising up so much but it takes you to a different place it, i mean a different way to look at it would be novelty it's something new it's that you know, I'm going along my life and nothing is changing and then I, I have a conversation with someone and it's a mutation, it's a change, it's something new that I've never been exposed to before and that that mutates me and it keeps echoing in my mind for days and weeks after and it becomes a guiding principle that affects my decision making, that affects so much of my life and it, it is altruistic in that it's not done for personal gain, it's not competition, it's not a battle of the wits, it's not a battle for who's right and who's wrong. And, who's smarter and who isn't and this and that and you know 
So I, I am kind of romantic in that sense, in that I do believe that there's a, um, you know, and it's also it's the basis of friendship, which, you know, now that I'm talking about James Hillman, I'll say that he had another kind of fun statement, which is that of all of the inventions of humankind, the greatest is, is friendship, the greatest mm. invention of all, because it's, you know, it's not self-interested, it's not tribal, it's not, it's the spirit of friendship, it's kind of like what, what Derrida would call hospitality, the spirit of hospitality, uh, you know, it's, it's this, this hospitality for each other, and that language is a sort of a, a you know, universal hospitality, or it can be, it can be used in the spirit yeah. of universal hospitality. Um, yeah. so I, I, I like that. But that's not saying it can't be used for all these other things. Too. No, yeah. Just... But yeah, I, I always feel like I kept coming back to like language and subtext, especially. Well, language allows you to bridge these gaps between people and then allows you to like create area for this subtextual information, which helps create a connection, like a mm -hmm. connection between two people more so than just like speaking, you know, like a deeper connection in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely see that. So, yeah, so the next yeah. bit you mm -hmm. talked about is um, kind of the sex, sex and that, uh, that figure of subtext. In a way. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is almost just the classic kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it's really, um, the kind of Freudian notion that, that everything is about sex, you know, that, that everything that we're, that uh, it's kind of, I mean, um, it's really just the figure of subtext that, you know, ultimately it's, it's all about flirtation, it's all about seduction, and that you can use that sexual metaphor for anything, you know, that um, a teacher is really seducing with their ideas, and that um, scientists who are arguing over something, they can also be flirting about it. They can be skeptical as a way of flirtation, that there's this link between skepticism and flirting. And, you know, if you want to flirt with somebody, you, you don't agree with them. You say, I'm not so sure about that. Hmm. And that, you know, saying, I don't know if I agree with that. That's already a sort of flirtatious remark. We, all, we already talk about flirting with ideas. There's a great, there's a great Adam Phillips book. Adam Phillips, the, the British uh, psychoanalyst and, and writer, you know, has a book called On Flirtation. And he, uh, you know, he talks about how we flirt with ideas and how, how we we're always, that there is a way of reading so much, uh, in the sense of interpreting so much of our activity as flirtation. Um, that flirtation doesn't necessarily mean that you want to even have sex with someone, but it's a sexualization or a kind of, you know, it's, it's amplifying the erotic dimension of language. Um, hmm. And this actually segues into this, something else I was talking about, which was that the, the demand for to eliminate subtext, and hence the, the title, No Subtext, the demand to get rid of subtext, to just say what you mean and mean what you say, and to just kind of bring it to this surface level of just being explicit, is in a way a desexualization. Um, it's a desexualization because it's removing that whole dimension. And I, I also, I, I know that I, one of the figures I used was, was the erotic, so here I'm being a little bit loose between the two. I mean, I, I guess yeah. the traditional Freudian sexual dimension, which is not yet fully erotic, says that we use subtext almost like we were saying before as signaling as code mm -hmm. and that signaling all comes from these from the id from the primal kind of animal instinct and the animal drive which is really an evolutionary instinct that just wants to mate it wants to have children and this is the kind of classic maybe even the naive reading of freud i think you know lacan is probably a bit more advanced here in his reading of freud but this is the naive reading of freud that ultimately we have a genetic imperative to reproduce go out and you know multiply and that's our imperative and so no matter what we say all of our great language is just an excuse you know me doing this talk now is just an excuse to show off something to signal something to signal that i'm a viable mate to signal huh. my intelligence so that you know, a woman, and yeah. this is very, you know, classically a heteronormative, will hear me talking and will think, okay, I want to have kids with this person because that person has good genetics because they're signaling their genetics through their, gotcha. their use of language. And so, so then I do kind of d distinguish it, and I, I, I guess we'd be skipping over one, but I do distinguish it fr from the erotic, which we yeah. can get to in a moment. Um, yeah, does that, does that sexual nature, is that, because you talk a bit about desire, is that kind of like a very, like, simplified form of desire? Because... Yeah, what I found pretty interesting, so you have this bit um, where you talk about subtext, is, or language maybe, is um, 
this kind of exchanging of desires almost and like trying to find um, to, to, it almost sounded like you're saying like desire is this thing that's trying to spread itself through people through our language and kind of this like um, uh, maybe a question again yeah. if if it's people signaling their desire or is it desire itself so in, in the terms of place like the procreation is are we just animals that are like being pushed to like you know are we just uh, donkeys for genetic code or something or is it are we people who like in our own self-interest are trying to procreate you know is there like some life force that's like trying to just drive yeah no is it yeah. personal or impersonal yeah. and I mean I think um, there's going to be different opinions of this but I mean for young there's the collective unconscious so it's rather impersonal I mean the big shock is that we're cut from this archetypal cloth that all of our most personal, intimate characteristics are actually rather impersonal when you look at it from that perspective. Um, they're also deeply personal. I mean, it's both. For, for Freud, yeah, I mean, it's very much this evolutionary metaphor, and there's now, you know, evolutionary psychologists who really run with that, and they even kind of reject Freud, but they're, they're very much about, this is all just about, you know, this kind of Darwinian approach, um, you know, um, I guess when I'm after Freud, there is the idea that, and I put this here, language is sublimated libido. Libido which escapes as subtext. So the idea of libido is that it's sort of this building up psychic tension. It's building up and, and it's demanding this physical release, and, and usually that release is through orgasm, but it can also be a release through a sort of braingasm. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, Jacques Lacan has this quote here, which I included, uh, for the moment, I am not fucking, I am talking to you. Well, I can have exactly the same satisfaction as if I were fucking. That's what sublimation means. Indeed, it raises the question of whether, in fact, I am not fucking at this moment. So, uh, you know, excuse my French, <laughs> literally, his French. But uh, no, it's um, it's just you know, it's this idea that uh, there's this great enjoyment, this substitute that language. And again, like it's it's you know, like emotional cheating. It's like, well, I, we weren't we weren't having sex. Well, yeah, but you were talking with with the same enjoyment that you would get from having sex. <laughs> So, um, but then I kind of say how sad it is. Does language satisfy our desire? Sadly not. Language instead teaches us what and how to desire. Through our use of language, we exchange desires. This is kind of what, what you're getting mm -hmm. at. I can learn to desire certain things by how I observe others using language. I can pass along my acquired desires to others. So it's, it's, um, it is something bigger than us. I mean, it is the symbolic order that is bigger than any of us that you know, I can enter into language and, a, and get a desire from someone who doesn't even know they're giving it to me, and then I can pass it along without even realizing I passed it along, and someone else can get it. And yeah. There are these kind of invisible mechanisms at work. Um, I have a quote from Zizek here. I don't know if this might be too long. Um, it's an amazing essay. Slavoj Zizek, Antinomies of Pure Sexuation. Um, I don't know, this might be a little bit, I, I, I'll go for it. Okay. The common wisdom tells us that, according to psychoanalysis, whatever we're doing, we're secretly thinking about that. Sexuality is the universal hidden reference of every activity. However, the true Freudian question is, what are we thinking when we are doing that? It is the real sex itself which, in order to be palatable, has to be sustained by some fantasy. And this is the first part of the quote, and this is the really interesting one because this is again saying there's a linguistic dimension, that there's a dimension of language here, that we're, we're more than just animals, we're speaking animals. And as mm -hmm. speaking animals, it's so enjoyable for others to even know. It's almost like for others to know or for others not to know, like either way, the other is part of it. Like either I'm keeping it a secret from somebody else gotcha, yeah. or I'm telling them, but either way, they play a role in my uh, you know, libidinal world, you know? Um, the ultimate, this is Zizek, the ultimate properly Freudian lesson is thus that the explosion of human symbolic capacities does not merely expand the metaphoric scope of sexuality. Activities that are in themselves thoroughly asexual can get sexualized. Everything can be, oh, this is, it's, it's, not, it's not only this. It's not only that everything can, can have this sort of sexual aspect. Much more importantly, this explosion sexualizes sexuality itself, meaning that sexuality itself is, is just this animal thing that's not actually that interesting to us. Yeah. What makes it sexy, quote unquote, is that we have um, all of the, the symbolic capacities, this explosion of human symbolic capacity, language. The specific quality of human sexuality has nothing to do with the you know, immediate, rather stupid reality of copulation. 
inclusive the preparatory mating rituals, it is only when animal coupling gets caught in a phantasmatic frame, and I would add to that a linguistic frame, that we get what we call sexuality. That sexual activity itself gets sexualized. Yeah. And this is through language, and this is through narrative, and, you know, through the fantasy that, you know, through the transgression of symbolic, you know, uh, it's just, it's basically, it, it all gets back to this, this symbolic dimension that that's what what makes us even, you know, uh, desire such things. That so well, it makes yeah. me, it makes me think of um, kind of the way, and this might be jumping ahead to the erotic, but like how I see the difference between sexual and erotic, and sexual mm -hmm. is much more kind of physical um, thing, and where the erotic is a bit more psychological. It seems it's it's kind of all the ideas and and personal like. Personal eroticism, it comes yeah. by your own little idiosyncratic psychological, you know. No, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think there's even a further distinction where, you know, Zizek is using the terms kind of interchangeably, and I, I use the, the term, you know, erotic to talk about, um, I get that particularly from James Hillman, and Hillman talks about the need for eros and for infusing our, our psychoanalysis with eros, and, you know, it's interesting because, um, I guess that that is true at that level, but also at that level, um, I am thinking, when, I, when I'm saying sexuality, I am kind of referring to the Freudian, Zizekian, Lacanian notion that it's already about language, but it's still about sexual desire. And the erotic is almost, yes, it's related to the sexual, but it's actually about, if I had to explain it, I would say that it's, um, it's more about the feeling function. It's about feeling itself, putting mm. feeling into things. And so even the language being used, I mean, the example I think of is that James Hillman says, you know, um, Freud is talking about basically all this really juicy stuff, all this sexual stuff, but he's talking about libido using a mechanistic metaphor as if it's some substance that's, you know, in a, um, you know, he's using the thermodynamic, the yeah. you know, psychodynamic metaphor. Of it's like, like the fuel you put in your car or something. Yeah, like and, and that for Hillman, he said, why don't we look at the etymology of, you know, libido? It's the same as lips. And when we start to think of lips and we start to look at the, the archetypal images, I'm using erotic almost to mean imaginal. Okay. And I know that that's a little bit vague because I also talk about the, the archetypal figures. But in a way, I, I, you know, I guess, I guess that's my, you know, we were talking earlier about shorthand. <laughs> I use the word uh, erotic in this essay as a shorthand to mean Hillmanian. Hill, James Hillman's approach, where he wanted to reinfuse eros into psychoanalysis, because he felt that psychoanalysis had become too dry, and that the words we were using, the language we were using, weren't juicy enough. They weren't imagistic enough. They weren't sexy enough in some sense, and so that he felt it was so desexualized or de. You know, eroticized, and, and and again, it is because I have the figure of the sexual and the, and the you know figure of the erotic. I, I guess it does get confusing, but I would just say when I'm talking about the figure of the sexual, I mean the Freudian tradition yeah. that Zizek is explaining there, where it's really it is about sex, but it's about the narratives we have around sex, and it's about you know that dimension of subtext is kind of like. Uh, you know, the subtext of like, it's some frat boys living together and the guy goes, oh, I gotta go buy some more condoms. The subtext is, oh, I'm getting a lot of sex. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm signaling that I'm a virile male who <laughs> has this power and whatever. That's not erotic. There's nothing erotic about that, you know? The, the erotic, I mean, it's not because it's, yeah, just, yeah. it's this brutish kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of Eros, I'm thinking of the way Hillman writes himself, the way he says, um, he's talking about soul and he says the soul is of the valleys and it's of the, the you know, I mean, he'll use sexual metaphors sometimes of wood nymphs and of um, the tor torpor of the, the I, I can't think of exactly how he says it, but he has this great, in, in peaks and veils, he has this, I mean, you, you can definitely read sexual undertones throughout his description of soul, but it's more than that, it's, it's poetic, it's the eros of poetry, it's this gotcha. heightened feeling, it's a heightened, like, it's almost like a overly, uh, and I wouldn't say overly even, but uh, it's this, it's this use of language that is very evocative. It's an evocative use of language that's very stimulating, and it stimulates the, the images in the mind in this, this way that, um, you know, we can use these metaphors of being excited or being turned on, but it's, it's very different than uh, the sort of signaling around sex and sexual prowess. Yeah. And that kind of... Is it like, is it, it's just that he doesn't want to be so explicit about it. 
Well, I think what to it, make it more powerful. So way. what what Hellman wants is really he he's calling for a reintroduction of eros into psychoanalysis because he believes the language doesn't speak to us anymore. He believes it's almost a, it's a practical thing that that to really captivate someone is to have this sort of you know erotic seductive dimension to be seduced by the images and that the images will stick with you and that hmm. it is for what I was talking about earlier for the the purpose of having a transformative effect or for really getting through to someone and connecting with them and. It's, you know, it has to be charged in a way, and it's charged with this kind of, you know, erotic energy. Um, but it's different than, again, the figure of the sexual, where it's all about signaling. It's signaling sexual prowess, or it's signaling that I'm being transgressive here, I mean, I'm being edgy. I, I would think of, um, you know, um, someone like Maggie Nelson, who I, I, I saw her talk, and I listened to, I, I read her books, and fantastic writer, but I don't think that she writes in an erotic way. She writes in a sexual way in this figure, because so hmm. much of what she's signaling is sexual power and sexual prowess, and there's such a, a focus on sex, and there's so much subtext about how much sex she's having and about oh, how really? sexual yeah. everything is, but the language itself, I mean, you can read James Hillman talk about a subject like the distinction between spirit and soul. Theoretically, there's nothing to do with sex there, but he, you know, he goes out of his way to, to write in a way about soul, um, and this is in Peaks and Veils, and he's, he's writing in a very you know, erotic way, or in Revisioning Psychology, he's talking about, um, you know, um, it's just he's writing in a very, it's, I wish I had some, some, some excerpts to read right now, uh, I don't, but I can say that, you know, like his, like tracing, you know, libido back to lips and talking about, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, Aphrodite and, and this kind of figure of Aphrodite and, and using the images of, of, of Aphrodite and the Aphroditic moment and, uh, when he's talking about... Um, he's using those in He's his, using the images, yeah. he's using the, the words, he's choosing language that's very poetic, that's ritually poetic, that is not simply signaling... He, there's, he's not signaling, I have a lot of sex. He's not signaling I'm a sexually virile person. He's not signaling okay. he's not signaling how transgressive and how edgy he is because I'm having non-heteronormative sex or I'm having I'm having that forbidden fruit, you know. He's not writing about the forbidden pleasures. That's all the figure of sex because huh. it's all in this economy. It kind of feeds into desire a bit more. And like, yeah. like that almost that like release that you're trying he's to He's writing with feeling. Yeah. He's writing with rich feeling and he's writing with precision of feeling, you know, very precise you know, um, he's wielding feeling like in this very precise way so that he, you know, all the, the tones are changing, the feeling tones are changing sentence to sentence, paragraph to paragraph, and there's a continuity through them, but there's also these subtleties and nuances, and you feel the feeling shift, and you feel it get serious, then you feel it get whimsical, and then you feel it, you know, he has you in the palm of his hands, and it, it is like a seductive thing. You're being mm -hmm. seduced by his writing, but the seduction is more at the level of feeling, and while he's He's mastering, I mean, he's, so it's, there's a prowess there, but it's not a sexual prowess, and he's not showing off how transgressive he is. It's not like, um, you know, again, how like Maggie Nelson is, is writing so much about these transgressive sexual experiences she's had, really edgy, and things yeah. that, you know, kind of the normal people wish they could experience, but they can't, and it's, so they, you almost read it with this thrill of like an erotic novel or something, but it's all about, you know, it's like it's like the entertainment we get from watching a TV show where the people are having extramarital affairs or they're having non-heteronormative sex or gotcha. they're having yeah. you know kink or all these different things and you're going wow that's so wild it's so it's so sexy but again that's still at this Freudian level of all the narrative of the narrative of the transgression and the narrative of I'm going to keep some secrets but you can guess what's happening behind closed doors and I'm going to tell you these things and reveal it it's it's okay. all the showing and hiding and the you know, revelation or not and with Hillman there's none of that game there's none of that sexual game of here I'm telling you and now I'm not telling you and I'm leaving this to your imagination and I'm, I'm you know revealing that there's none of that he's not implying that he's having sex with his students or something like that that yeah. would be very transgressive or he's not implying that he's having non-heteronormative sexual encounters there's none of this you know with with you know Maggie Nelson you're reading her work and you want to keep turning the page because you want to see what's going to happen next and what's the next you know, huh. is she going to be talking about the sexual thrill she feels while she's breastfeeding? Or is she going to be yeah. talking about the sexual thrill she has of having a sexual encounter with someone she doesn't know what, what gender they are? You know, Was she, Is she distracting from whatever are. message she's trying to communicate, you think, by doing that? or I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think she's the message is very much around this sort of game of transgression and edginess and playing on the boundaries of the symbolic order of what's... 
you know, of going against the conventional, uh, it's very, you know, it's very edgy. It's, it's all, it's like, it's, it's edging even to make it even more of a sexual metaphor. You know, it's sort of, uh, you, you want to keep turning the pages and she's very enjoyable to read because you want to keep getting to the next provocative thing, but it's still very much, and I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's very much in, uh, in this, this Freudian, you know, what Zizek is talking about where it's, it's, sexualizing sexuality itself. It's like she's an expert of sexualizing sexuality. Okay. She's an expert at, at making sexuality itself seem so thrilling when really it's just this animal copulation level. At this other level, you know, it's not thrilling at all. But what Hillman's doing has nothing to do with sex. That's why I, I called it the, you know, erotic because I really wanted to have that sort of resonance to the idea of eros being um, feeling, really. If we think of logos as thinking and eros as feeling and that it's so different, you know, you, you read something like Argonauts by Maggie Nelson and it's very much monotone and it's great, but there's not a lot of difference of feeling tone. But then you read Hillman and when he's talking about spirit, he's talking about Mount Olympus and, and he's talking about the, you know, and the, the, the Mount of Olives and all of these great mountains and you're filled with this rich imagery and he's talking about standing on the top of the mountain and looking out and surveying and, that, and the austere white lilies that grow in the icy mountain tops and all these rich images that he's using are, you know, the language of spirit and then he's talking mm -hmm. about, this is again in Peaks and Veils and he's talking about soul and he's using this, to me that's what I would say is, you know, uh, erotic is that he's, he's using images of, um, you know the, the the swirling mists that cling to the trees and the the, the humid fogs and the that the that the forest nymphs were called nymphs because they were originally thought to be the the mists that cling to the trees and the valleys and that you know he's using these really uh, or you know he has an amazing essay in uh, Pan and and the Nightmare where he talks about the goat god Pan and you know he, it's very much full of feeling and you're getting the feeling of terror at a certain point and then you know at a different point you're getting the, the feeling of exhilaration or the thrill of, of panic and at a different point you're getting the feeling of um, you know all these different feeling tones that he's conveying with this really rich imagery so as you're reading it it's sort of constellating these images with you know inside of you and that in, in your imagination, these images are kind of appearing and they're, they're sending shivers at one point and they're sending, mm -hmm. it's a very, um, you know, it's, it's masterful in the way that a good poem is masterful, that it, it's, it's the mastery of feeling itself and it's not really playing with the boundaries of what's socially acceptable or not the way Maggie Nelson does, or playing with the boundaries of what's But it's kind of more in the realm of language not. game. Yeah, of, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he's using language, but he's using language yeah. to escape language and to get into the world of images. Gotcha. And so, she's using language as a way to signal how anti-normative she is. You know? <laughs> how, how are you distinguishing that mode of speaking from just speaking more subtextually? Like, it, it almost, when you describe it, maybe it's because I've been... Yeah, I'm talking about subtext so much. Like it sounds like you're talking about someone who's speaking with so much subtext. Well, it is, but again, I'm saying four figures of subtext. So, like the first example, the sexual subtext was like the frat boy said, "I'm going to go buy more condoms." The subtext there is, "I'm getting laid a lot." Gotcha. You know, okay. and then Hillman says, "You know, um, talking about spirit is the mount of all." Of I mean, he doesn't even have to say we're talking about spirit. He can just say, you know, he can say a bunch of things, and you can say, "Well, what do they have in common?" And you can put a word on that. But really, the subtext that he's conveying is that feeling tone. Um, gotcha. You know. Okay. So yeah, again, these are maybe just different forms of subtext. Um, the one that we skipped over, and, and I, I know that we we should probably wrap up soon, but the one that we kind of skipped over was just the the archetypal, the, the thematic. And I know that I'm a little loose there too because Hillman does this as well. I mean, obviously, when he's talking about a lot of different images, they do have an archetypal theme. For me, I said, um, you know, I was basically calling it um, the numinous. Um, and the, the numinous, I was basically trying to kind of say this is, um, I, I, I guess for me, the, when I talk about Hellman and I talk about the erotic, I am talking more on the side of soul, according to Hellman's distinction between spirit and soul. That spirit and soul are used, you know, often interchangeably, but really this, the soulful is something that's deeper and slower and more fundamental and more uh, human and that the spirit is the zeal and the zest and the passion and the inspiration from on high and so on. And so that the subtext, the so-called spiritual subtext then, that's the one I kind of skipped over, this would be, um, it's really um, the archetypal subtext where the archetypes are not yet at the level of feeling tone, 
they're at the level of concept or they're at the level of, um, you know, this is almost like when I'm going to read, um, or I watch a, a, a Tesla car commercial and I say, what's the subtext there? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a subtext at the level of the numinous, the subtext, you know, at, at the, the textual level, we're selling cars. And at the subtext level, we're selling a dream of the myth of progress, of the idea gotcha. that, yeah. you know, cutting edge. that humans, yeah, we're cutting edge, this is the future, and that it's, it's very even masculine myth of man against nature and man against wilderness, and that the human's destiny is to boldly go where no man has gone before, and all this, and there's nothing erotic about that at all. It's not filling me with erotic, it's not, it's not like how Hillman is really playing at that level of feeling. I mean, yeah, you can say there's a feeling of excitement or a feeling of this or that, but it's mm -hmm. not It's not that. It's really just this archetypal complex that's been constellated. Um, and that's what I'm saying is at the level of the numinous there. So that would be... So again, there's the, the figure of power, which we talked about earlier. There's the figure of sex, which we're kind of saying is sort of signaling around sex and around transgression and around how we relate to the collective in terms of the language it uses and in terms of how we're positioning ourselves. You know, I'm going to reveal this and I'm not going to reveal that. It's kind of the game of showing and, and hiding. And then we move on to the numinous with Jung and that's, that's really the archetypal themes. That's, you know, you read a piece of literature and you talk about what thematics are at work in that piece of literature and what are the underlying themes and what are the underlying narratives that aren't really obvious but are kind of the the second story being told you know the, the surface story is tesla selling cars and the second story is tesla selling the dream of of man against nature or something you know and then and then the final one yeah is, is um you know is again about uh you know what is erotic um so i'm just going to read um just a little bit here um So, let's see. So I say it is the mystic and the poet who carry the erotic through the ages. Um, and I make a little reference to the idea of sexual difference. And I, I refer to Alenka Zupanchik. And I quote her. Um, and she talks about... Um, how sexual difference is sort of a fundamental of you know, metaphysics and of, of mysticism. Traditional ontologies and traditional cosmologies were strongly reliant on sexual difference, taking it as their very founding or structuring principle. Yin yang, water, fire, earth, sun, matter, form, active, passive. This kind of often explicitly sexualized opposition was used as the organizing principle of these ontologies and or cosmologies as well as of the sciences, astronomy, for example, based on them. And this is how Lacan could say primitive science is a sort of sexual technique. At some point in history, one generally associated with the Galilean revolution in science and its aftermath, both science and philosophy broke with this tradition. And if there is a simple and most general way of saying what characterizes modern science and modern philosophy, it could be phrased precisely in terms of the desexualization of reality of abandoning sexual difference in more or less explicit form as the organizing principle of reality, providing the latter's coherence and, and intelligibility. So that is Alenka Zupanchik, Sexual Difference in Ontology. And, you know, what, the reason I put this in here is because I was kind of saying um, this is the state we're in, which is kind of similar to what um, Hillman said in Revisioning Psychology, which is that we're in a very dry state where there's a very dry there's an expectation that academic writing will say what it means and to not have a lot of subtext in these. I mean, certainly that's not always true. In fact, that's one of the criticisms against continental philosophy that so much of it is so rich in subtext and so, but you know, there is this, um, well, and I was also just kind of making a side point, which is really not the main point of the essay at all, but it's, it's the question of sexual difference. And I touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, and that's really a different conversation, but it's, it's just kind of talking about, um, just that there's a the desexualization, you know, it's, it's funny, I even said, um, for the perverse, even sex itself is desexualized, that there's a, a funny idea that we think of perversion as hypersexual, but in a way it's, it's removing what, this is kind of a dense psychoanalytic notion, so mm -hmm. we don't like to dig into that as much, but, um, well, but I, yeah. I, I felt like, maybe it was just me personally, and kind of, it aligned more with the way I thought, that 
it kind of all culminated into kind of Hillman's point being this further and more rich version of subtext. And I'm not sure if that's how you meant it. Or I mean, I, mean I, I did put it at the end because I do feel like Hillman has a very... Um, yeah, no, it is. I mean, I, I do feel like um, these others are kind of ways of using subtext, but I feel like Hillman's is this... this um, you know, it's it's really is kind of I don't want to make it this holy grail figure, but it is it's poetry and it's mysticism. It's the way that we can really get through to people um, in a rich way, so that you know, it's it's like you have a long conversation. And what do you really remember? You remember the image, you know. And I, I think about uh, when Hillman was talking about old age, for instance. He was saying, you know, um, you think of the uh, um, there's a certain courage and the strength of old age and so we use these words like courage and strength okay great but then he says there's something you know you can imagine an old woman and she's getting up and she's slinging the bag of groceries over her shoulder and she's crossing the street and not even looking in the direction of the traffic and you know you guys are getting these images in your head and you kind of remember that and you think about it, it gives you a different feeling of that courage yeah. and that you know determination of what, what it is to face each day you know as an elder and it's very different than just saying oh yeah you're when you there's a courage there. There's a dignity there. Well, show me an image of that dignity, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I do feel like, um, you know, I, I, I have a special respect for the mystical and for the, the poetic. And, um, and I, I think that these can all work on multiple levels simultaneously. I think Jung was very poetic and Jung was very mystical. And I think Freud had these great poetic images that you can tease out of his work. And even, you know, Maggie Nelson, who I was talking about earlier, was saying how much everything of hers is focused on sex. Well, she's a poet as well. I mean, she writes wonderful poetry, and she can absolutely work on that level of feeling tone. But I, I just think of Hillman as really this, um, the first one that I encountered who really c c codified it. He he made it into a, or I mean, maybe not even, that's not even the right term. He really, um, he pointed it out. He just made it so explicit that this is what he's doing, that 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 he's reinvigorating the sort of you know psychoanalytic tradition with eros he's putting eros back into it and uh he's he's not satisfied with the dry you know way of, of talking about things using only abstract concepts and using only even the term abstract concepts you know you get I me mean, yeah. you wouldn't it's so interesting, you know, yeah. Where it seems like Maggie Nelson separated her, like, kind of conceptual work and her maybe creative work more. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, or it's just that, you know, I, I, I think, I don't want to single her out. I, I think a lot of people use poetic work. I, I'm just saying that Hillman in particular is, is especially important because he's so aware of what he's doing that he, he really comes across as a master when he's talking about spirit and soul and then he kind of says at the end you know i've described these two using the language of soul which is also again this language of eros using these rich images and feeling tones and then he says and then and then when he starts to use more technical language almost like as a little example you realize how dry it is he says i could have just as easily approached it from the language of spirit um i could have said spirit is abstract and you know universal and soul is particular and specific and you know he starts using these words like general and specific and imminent and transcendent and uh -huh. they, they don't ring true but when he's talking about spirit and he says it's like standing on the top of a mountain and looking out over the land and as a surveyor and partitioning it and you know dividing it so you can make your map of it and have your map to guide you and you know you start to get this Actually, yeah. this image of this person standing and looking out and they have their long vision and foresight and then you you know you're in the you're in the um, valleys and you can't see very far and you're kind of in the thicket and you're in the weeds and and the vines are pulling at you and you're you can't see you know you're all these things i mean it's just it gives you a very different image um that soul is what entangles us and what gets us caught up and tripped up in things and then the actual details of life and yeah you know and again you could approach it kind of abstractly and say oh the spirit is the transcendent and the universal and soul is the imminent and the particular and you know yeah. these words don't resonate the so, same way so you've got these four figures of subjects the power the sexual spirit and eros and i don't know if you want to go through them a little bit because i kind of interrupted before but no no that i think we pretty um, much covered them yeah yeah what what do you feel like then ultimately between all four of them is like what what, they're, what are they coming up against or what are they kind of what what is it essentially that if we can maybe pinpoint 
where subtext exists in some way. Like, what are they all interacting with, or what is that? Because for me, it always felt like it was this point of connection between people. I um, mean, you have this. Actually, I just really like the the last bit. And maybe you can read the fuller quote that kind of goes into it more. Um, that using subtext or um, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm talking about the frustration of language. I mean, I definitely think this is a very um, interpersonal thing where subtext exists between two people or between a speaker and a listener. I mean, it's kind of, the question of existence gets back to this, there's an ontological question, and I, I kind of stay away from these a lot. You know, ontology is kind of the study of grounding and foundations and what what is existence and what exists and what doesn't and what do we consider and there's always these questions of do numbers exist do qualities exist you know uh, do fictional characters exist and there's um, this idea this school of thought called artifactualism and uh, it's the idea that um, you know that for a fictional character that yes fictional characters exist but they exist because there's an artifact there's a book that they've been written in or a film or a play or you know whatever it is and then there's an author who wrote it, and there's an audience who can read it. And if the last person, and if, if, no, if nobody wrote it, then it doesn't really exist. And if it doesn't, if we don't have the artifact anymore, it doesn't exist. And if we have the artifact and nobody can read it, it doesn't exist. And so subtext is kind of the same way. I mean, in a, in a way, it's kind of like, does subtext exist if, if you're saying it in an empty room? Well, no, it needs to have somebody that, does it exist if somebody doesn't pick up on it? Well, maybe, because the unconscious may still pick up on it. I mean, that's the interesting thing, you know. If, you know, subtext may operate without us even realizing it. Two people could be having a conversation mm -hmm. while there's a second conversation neither of them are yeah, at all aware of <laughs> underneath that. Maybe even a third party could see it and be like, oh, you guys, come on, get a room or something. You know? But uh, So yeah, but I think at the end I kind of talk about the frustration of language. I talk about anxiety, the anxiety of language, of, of trying to be free from this anxiety and what we're trying to do. And I say... Um, I, I quote Lacan, anxiety is the only emotion which doesn't lie. We should thus be thankful for it. <laughs> but such gratitude is not easily found. Each of us must put up with the fact that language is equivocal. You know, people use the word unequivocal a lot. Well, to be equivocal is to be ambiguous, to, you know, equivocate, it's to, to be uncertain. That subtext is ever present, that all our attempts to raise the subtext to the text and thus desexualize or depotentiate are only temporary stopgaps before we once again fall under the crashing waves of language. Waves that drown us a thousand times over in the painful pleasure of jouissance. French for, um, oftentimes used for the term orgasm even, but it's, it's seen to be kind of what's beyond pleasure. I mean, you know, jouissance is like, um, it's pleasurable to have a bite of ice cream or a bowl of ice cream. It's jouissance to eat the whole pint, you know. It's pleasurable to have a cigarette. It's jouissance to smoke the whole pack. It's to get to that point of painful yeah, okay. pleasure. Going beyond pleasure to where it becomes pain, to where it's you're taking pleasure in the pain. So, you know, we only have these temporary stop gaps before we once again fall under the crashing waves of language. The painful pleasure of jouissance. This is our lot in life. All we can do is learn to love it. And that requires a willingness to withstand the aporia of not knowing, of never really knowing for sure if the subtext we noticed was real or not. You know, an aporia is kind of a point of paradox or it's a point of confusion. It's a particular sensitive point of, of not knowing. It isn't radical skepticism. It's more the opposite. Radical faith. The faith that comes with the knowledge that it is only through the uncertainty of language itself that we become truly human. Yeah, and I really like that that last line. It seems it seems to be like that's kind of what it is is just kind of accepting that there isn't there is something you're just not going to know. And I feel like the question that came up a lot when we talked about subtext was like, should we even use subtext? Should we just try and talk about everything. And I feel like there is a certain magic in there not being every and not everything being spoken you know absolutely yeah. to, to try to talk about it all is to try to do everything you can to remove the to desexualize it to remove the potency from it and to kind of try to make it safe and um you know to try to make it to you know it's like if we're living this kind of fearful safe life where we want everything to have no risk involved then well make sure you get it in writing it's kind of you know make sure everything's explicit yeah. make sure nothing is left unsaid and um you know and then there's no surprise and there's no potential for that um 
it's like we, we need that potential for that frustration and that satisfaction. Here's where I, I really like Adam Phillips, um, again, the, the British psychoanalyst, where he says, you know, if something can satisfy us, it can also frustrate us. And we get these fantasies of something that can only satisfy, and we, we end up, you know, wanting to guard against the potential for frustration because, you know, with subtext, there is the potential that it wasn't really there because it wasn't made explicit. But there's also the potential that it is, and there's this thrill, and there's this, it's the potential for satisfaction and frustration. It can be immensely frustrating because you can get the wrong idea about something. Maybe you thought the person was flirting with you and they really weren't, and, you know, it can be immensely frustrating, but then it can also be so satisfying to find out they really were. Yeah. You know, it's a very much... Or it might a, be even just satisfying that possibility, you know, like, was that girl... Yeah, like, or, or, or yeah. boy yeah. or man yeah. or woman or anything, yeah. you know, it's absolutely, it's... Um, no, so I, I think, you know, this, the subtext is all about, there, there's a risk there. There's a risk, and the faith is kind of, um, the faith that, that life is really better when we have those risks, when we have those uncertainties. That as much as we have the fantasy that if we could eliminate all the uncertainty from life, it would be better, it, it really wouldn't. That, that the uncertainty is, is part of being human and part of what makes life enjoyable. Thanks. Would you like to yeah. talk a little bit about the scene? Um, yeah, well, I guess a little bit. Um, yeah, so I feel like a lot of the things that we we talked about, and thanks, Jonah, for doing this again. Um, Thank you. Definitely came up in a lot of different ways in the scene as well. Like, I mean, just in our you know our conversation, I I even just pulled from other people's little writings and stuff to kind of bring some like very common themes forward, and it was a lot of it's just around this like it seems to be it's like this interpersonal relationship and how subtext is all about this kind of communication between people and also trying to understand people like and maybe like not not having to know in order to understand which I think is um, a very interesting um, mm. idea and and mm. that is yeah. yeah yeah that you don't have to know everything you know you don't have to get them to say everything you can have a certain empathy or understanding yeah. An unspoken understanding. It's like we have an understanding. Yeah. <laughs> I think people say that, you know, we have yeah. an understanding. So the yeah, so the the zine goes, um, like I said, from kind of a more explicit textual um, kind of reflective to tone to a kind of more creative and maybe subtextual tone. And there's a bit of illustration that I did throughout the entire zine that um, goes along with each of the pieces and then kind of tells its own story in its own way and um, yeah, we're just uh, got a lot of cool people um, involved and mostly friends of ours who are kind of just interested in getting their own ideas and work out there. And some of the people don't necessarily write or do art very often, but it's just about kind of coming together and doing um, a little project. And that's what um, myself and Vernon and Sam are all kind of trying to foster a little bit is this, this kind of this project um, that can have a lot of facets to it and brings a lot of people in and kind of just for sharing our ideas and it's our own personal outlet for kind of our more creative endeavors. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll it'll be on it'll be online too with the, the posting. Well, I, I read um, an in progress version of your essay and I can't wait to read the final the final uh, publication. But um, I really really enjoyed what. You <laughs> did you want to talk about that at all, or did you want to um, just just have it be a surprise? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't think I have it printed out, but uh, just to kind of close, yeah, I can chat about it a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I I talked a lot about kind of my viewpoints, which are kind of come out through my my reflection um, during our conversation. Um, I feel like the main points and the main things that I kind of thought about was um, just that like trying to almost like share experience through language is kind of what I felt subtext um, was and, and if I think about like certain interactions I've had with people and we talk about like it's kind of like that shorthand thing, but when you do it with a stranger, it's like, usually when you like meet somebody, like sometimes there's just that kind of chemistry, that spark, and I think that just shows like a very 
it kind of points to kind of like a rich area of subtext between the two people that kind of exists almost um, without any sort of common base. And I think that's, I guess in that way, it's more of an indicator than um, um, than anything else. But it's just this kind of communication that cer certain people can have and that you can also grow over time and something foster. And it's this like really kind of rich and deep aspect to like the social, the social world. And it's kind of how I feel like subtext lands. It's, yeah. yeah, when you have that with someone, you can just say very few words, but it'll like light up a lot in that person. Yeah. Kind of indicate a lot. You can say a lot with a few words. Yeah. You, know? you don't have to really explain yourself so much. You can just kind of, they, they understand you, they get it, you know, they, um, it, um, it is, yeah, it's like a shorthand. It's like you can just kind of communicate in this very rich way that maybe an outsider would listen to that and say, well, they don't really, you know. Yeah, like what are they? I missed that. What, wait, what yeah. was that about? It's like, oh, no, no. You, you know, it's like the yeah. inside joke or something. It's yeah. like there's very much um, inside connection. Yeah, but I'm, I'm excited for the whole, the whole zine for sure. And um, I did do the art, and this might be the last one that I do all the art for just so I can kind of focus on other stuff, so... Okay. Um, I felt really, felt really good about that. Hopefully, we'll get some more artists in. We did haven't been able to get as much visual art in, um, mm. and as much as writings, but that's totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am really, really excited to read it. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen little sneak previews, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm really happy to be a part of it. And really excited yeah. To read it, so. Yeah, man, your your writings are welcome at any time, and we can post them. Um, on medium under the liminal limit yeah so the the umbrella project is is called liminal and it's going to be this kind of like mm -hmm. um pseudo like publishing sort of yeah uh, uh, liminal group. the uh, lemon is like the threshold the yeah edge, the, yeah the, the doorway the, yeah that's great cool yeah so thanks jenna we recorded this in jonah's apartment in ballard in seattle on a pretty nice setup i don't know if yeah, no, and I'm really happy, uh, happy to do this, and uh, hopefully it's the first of many. Yeah, it's definitely a long time coming, for sure. <laughs>